here we go. November numbers are in. What is it going to look like? You know what? I haven't seen them, but I know our main man, Dean. We got some new guests today, Chad, and we, we are going to give you the numbers of November, the retail season. Where are we at, everybody? What's going on and how is it going to work moving forward? Let's get in. Man, it is a jammed house today, everyone. Gentlemen, how are we? Good. Wonderful. Good. Good. Good day. So for all y'all that are listening instead of watching today, um, we've got to my left, <laughs> Dean, below me, Chad, and of course, Jeff over down, no. down here. Down, yeah, 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 it's always backwards, brother. It's always backwards. So yeah, yeah. here's the big question. I think we've all been waiting and, and looking and wondering what the retail season was going to be, what kind of the shipping, if you will, November for shopping, um, imports, exports, all that. And I understand the numbers are in, and we've actually got a uh, new gentleman here for, with us this morning. We have Chad Kennedy, another gentleman from DAT. We're just meeting Chad today. And I am looking forward to this conversation, gentlemen. So I'm not sure which one of y'all want to start, but somebody jump in. Yeah, well, I'll start off with um, the import numbers that came in on Monday. And uh, then we can go to Chad because the one of the reasons we wanted Chad on was to talk about the question we raised last week about trends in the shipper community. Yeah. Mm. And no better person to answer that than Chad Kennedy on our shipper team. So um, we pull our data for imports from the IHS market uh, peers database. So it gets processed as once the bills of lading are cleared by the Customs and Border Patrol. So there's a, probably a dozen vendors out there that process bills of lading. It's an incredibly ugly database that comes from the CBP. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to scrub it, clean it, filter it, and then you end up with a data point that says, here's what we think the number of containers were. I mention that because when you see the numbers that are posted by the various people, whether it be the National Retail Federation or myself or, you know, the folks at Freight Waves, when I say there was 2.131 million uh, containers imported, you will see different numbers across mm -hmm. different data suppliers. And it's got to do with how they filter the data and how they handle certain bills of lading. So the, that, the, the variance is not significant, but just so you know that not everybody reports CBP data the same way. Um, so not surprisingly, imports fell in uh, November. The October peak was a little bit later than usual, so there was certainly some more imports coming in, uh, maybe to, to replenish the uh, re uh, uh, depleted inventories. Uh, imports fell 9% month over month. A couple of data points worth, in, uh, worth talking about. West Coast volumes are returning at the expense of the East and Gulf Coasts. That's important because that was a trend that was the opposite in 2021 and 2022 when a lot of volume moved to the East Coast. A um, couple of data points worth thinking about. Volumes are decreasing on the East Coast, led by a 18% month-over-month decline in New York. It's the third largest port, about 15% of the volume. Uh, East Coast overall volumes are down 12%. On the West Coast, where about a third of our imports are processed, uh, imports were up 5% in the Port of Los Angeles. So think about number one and two, New York, Los Angeles. Uh, New York um, down 18, Los Angeles up five. That's very interesting. Um, the Gulf Coast, though, is increasingly impacted by the ongoing drought in the Panama Canal. Imports plunge 24% month over month. In the largest port in the region, in Houston, uh, volumes are 15% lower on the import side. Of course, that is, I think, directly relational to the reduction in draft. The draft restrictions in the Panama Canal are down from 50 to 44 feet. Uh, it essentially takes off about 3,000 containers per vessel. There's a lot of congestion. Uh, people are starting to avoid the Panama Canal. It will impact a couple of things, produce that comes up from the west coast of Chile. A lot of our grapes and uh, berries over winter come up through the Panama Canal. They will be impacted, so will price. Uh, the bigger impact, though, is on oil and gas exports out of Houston to Asia. That is certainly being impacted by now. If you go onto any of the data trackers, you can see a massive amount of containers 
and tanker vessels just piled up either side of the Panama Canal. So big changes there. Why, why those that are in the capacity purchasing business should think about this? We saw a lot more truckload volume move into the Gulf Coast uh, in the last two years. That's now starting to change because if the volumes are dropping, carriers will have to reposition those assets away from uh, declining volumes in the southwest uh, part of the country and possibly the southeast. But the volumes are certainly returning to the west coast, uh, which is great news for those carriers. Uh, and just wanting to wrap up, uh, at 2.131 million 20-foot equivalent units, TEU, in November, that's about 6% higher than last year. And compared to November over the last eight years, last month's volume was about 5% higher. So we're still bringing in more volume and more volume compared to prior years. So that's, I mean, that's good news for all of us, I think. Um, the, I mean, the, the downside, of course, is some of the data points that Jason Miller reported this week, and that is that uh, credit card delinquency rates for consumers are climbing. And uh, we, are, we probably are you know, paying for things we can't afford more than ever. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Dean, um, so two things for, for everybody watching and listening. I was really worried when you were talking there because I, I made a claim on the title and the introduction in this in this podcast um, where November numbers was in, everyone's going to love it. And then <laughs> you're going through and I'm thinking, damn, I just had some serious <laughs> clickbait. Um, but it came back and I love the fact that right. we are up year over year after yeah. eight years yeah. considering yeah. where we are. Yeah. You know, we spoke, if you guys remember a couple of weeks ago, right after kind of uh, the numbers came in for Black Friday and all that, yeah. Cyber Monday and all that, when we spoke on the Wednesday, remember we said that Master, I believe it was MasterCard reported like an increase of 2.6% people using cards. And I asked the question, do you guys think this is like, because they don't necessarily have the cash, they don't have the money, right. is it something, right. are we going to face like crisis down the road with, and it seems and to be here we are. that <laughs> you know, people spent more than they have, yeah. hence they're in this position. Um, so it's funny how our conversations end up, well, yeah, I'll, okay, I'll say it. We're right a lot of Most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab <laughs> yeah absolutely. It. I yes. remember that conversation. Absolutely. You remember that, Jeff? Yes, so it's sir. interesting how it's coming out. And yeah, I, you know, some of the things that I see when I go grocery shopping, right? Already I see, um, you know, bananas being brown before they're even bought or they're like super green where they're super almost uneditable, right? Yeah. And I'm finding fruit and veg that's either like, again, way too premature or way too mature. Um, and, I, and I go to different grocery stores, so I don't know what it's like for you guys, but um, I'm having a real hard time, like when it comes to lettuce, when it comes to fruits and veg and all this kind of stuff to get some good stuff. I mean, I haven't had any solid zucchinis in months. Hmm. Like you buy them and they're, they're soft and mushy. And, and do you guys see the issues with the Panama Canal, the issues with now, obviously going into wintertime, most of our fruits and veg coming from overseas. Do you see this becoming an issue? Wait, you know something, Dan, just real quick, Dean, because I know you're going to chime Perfect. in. You know, you're, you're talking about, just think about this logically, right? The bananas being really, really green. Now, when they're picked and they're shipped, they're on the water for a long period of time. So they start to ripen up. You know, they're not that real green, green color. So what does that say about the transit times, how fast they're picking it? and why they're still green when they hit the United States. You know, that's just just something to think about because you don't mm -hmm. see that quite often. But you're right. I have seen really green, green, green bananas yeah. out there. Why? And, and you gotta, and you bring up a point, Jeff. What were they like when they picked them? Like they that, were probably like my point. Like that's rocks, my point. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Thinking that they're going to ripen up a little bit before they go through inspection, before they hit, you know, the stores that we buy from. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem that way, though. It just doesn't seem that way. They're just really too green right now. And, so, and there's something else, and, and maybe Dean, uh, Dean and Chad, you guys can can chime into this. Um, I, I can't help but start thinking if things come across on containers, they hit ports, they get put into reefer trucks, and <clears throat> team drivers bring it up for on produce runs. 
they open up the doors and the bananas are not as ripe as they want them to be and they refuse it. Hmm. Right now we're running into all these different claims for reefer companies when they just like, you know, for trucking companies, I shouldn't say reefer companies, trucking companies, um, where I look at it and I say, okay, now are we going to start seeing an increase in claims because stuff sat for so long on the water that they didn't expect hmm. kind of thing, if that makes sense. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. I, I, I wonder if it's, um, this is just speculation, but I wonder if it's that the, the supply chain adjusted to picking much earlier hmm. when the, when the backups were so long, right. And the dwell time was sure. so long and some of that's alleviated, especially stateside. We've cleared a lot of that out and hmm. the, the picking uh, lead time just hasn't adjusted to, to account for that. Cause I'm seeing the same thing down in Florida, uh, especially at some of the um, lower cost stores that you go to. It's like all green. There's no yellow all green. bananas to choose yeah. from. It's like the challenge to find a few, yellow ones in there. Some of the premium stores I go to, um, I, I do get a little bit more of the yellow. So I don't, I don't know if they're ne negotiating and uh, have a higher tolerance at some of the lower cost stores. Yeah, but probably the picking. Yeah. Yeah. So, negotiating the picking. Yeah. So I think, I think the broader theme with this discussion is um, weather is having a sig significant impact on supply chains, but also on certain commodities, right? So we started off talking about produce. Um, I think what we're seeing, Dan, is that there will be an impact on price as the supply chain gets dis disrupted, particularly around produce. Mm. But there, also could, there also is an impact on demand or, or volume, I should say, which is affecting truckload volumes because in the produce market, a lot more of it moves on spot than all other modes of freight mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. a lot of brokered freight, a lot of it's farm, a lot of it's time sensitive, a lot of it's multi-pickup. Like, you know, it's not unusual. I've got a friend of mine doing 14 drops in Florida today with a load what? of right? 14 drops over two days with refrigerated produce. That's not unusual. I mean, the LTL produce can pay really well, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, it's what a I, lot of overflow too, Dean. A lot yeah. of overflow. That's why. But that's a serious out. schedule. Seven drops in one day. Like yeah, that's, that's a little, serious schedule to hit. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of carriers that will run LTL, reefer, hazmat. You know, like it's incredibly profitable. You don't have to do too many loads a week to make that pay. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making is that I think weather is having an impact on where capacity moves to. And I'll give you an example. Um, we had, remember Hurricane Hillary came through in August mm -hmm. and that rain uh, flowed all the way up into the Pacific Northwest. What it did, it impacted the current onion crop and, it, and because the onions became wet. And when the wet onions don't store as well and they have more shrinkage. Yep. And, and what happened is uh, volumes dropped and prices have gone up. But because the second hurricane that came through Acapulco wiped out the entire onion crop, we've got less volume coming across through Sonora into Nogales. So reefer volumes are down there, but up significantly in the Pacific Northwest for loads of onions. So when you go to the USDA website, they report a shortage of trucks to move onions out of the Pacific Northwest. And that's why we're seeing pretty good spot rates for reefer loads out of that area. So you can connect the dots between weather and volumes and price. It's just yep. something to keep an eye on. It it seems to be a pattern that occurs every time there's weather impact. You can bet there's a supply chain ripple somewhere down the road. Makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, that's all I've got on the on the import side, Dan. We've got. We probably should jump into Chad's part because that's probably a good segue, yeah. right? To the ship yeah, it's a great segue. Yeah. yeah. Was, You're a segue master, buddy. What, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, you think I haven't done this before? What was the question last week we asked that I said I couldn't answer? Do you remember what the shipper trend oh, question was? Yeah. So what what shipper trend, like what we're seeing with shippers when it comes to um, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to phrase it in a normal sense because it was one of those things that just kind of popped out of, I think it was Jeff, but yeah. um, it was it was like, you know, how are shippers planning what are they doing when sales are kind of doing one of these and, and then all of a sudden things drop and like, where are they at with the, the mindset of what's coming in, what's being imported, their, their warehousing and all that kind of stuff. But, and one follow-up, just real quick, Chad, before you answer this, you know, uh, Dean was saying last week that you're seeing a lot of the long haul carriers go to the regional and super regional areas where there's more work. So did the pattern for the shippers pull back a little bit and redistribute uh, their products closer to their uh, client base in order to have that happen? Because how are they moving it across country 
if that truckload uh, carriers are moving or migrating, I should say, more to that regional and super regional, what are they doing? Yeah, all good questions. Um, let me hit on the question that Dan posed first, and I've jotted yours down, Jeff, so I, I'll try to hit on that as well. I, I think I might be a little bit more suited to answer Dan's question, uh, the second being more of a, a supply chain design uh, question. Um, so first, let me start off with just short background on myself. So um, I started out as a carrier. I worked, I married into a trucking company, Gene Hyde Trucking, uh, um, uh, in 2005, worked for them for about five years. And then I was with Chuck, the pallet company, uh, for about 10 years as a director of transportation there. In the last five years, I've been with uh, Chainalytics. Uh, we spun off a division that got acquired by DAT. Um, so I've been very close to the shipper side um, for for 15 years and a bit of exposure to the carrier side, small regional carrier as well. Um, from a trend perspective, what we hear from our shippers, especially with this volatility, volatility is like their uh, week to week, day to day volatility, um, forecast demand not being fulfilled is is their, one of their top pain points. Um, and it's, it's often a, a thing that we talk about quite a bit. Some of the trends that we're seeing is how they think about procuring that freight differently. Um, so, for example, you know, 10 years ago, um, spot and broker were often a bad word for a shipper. They would try to reduce the number of brokers that they use. They would try to, um, in all cases, reduce the amount of spot that they used. And so that that kind of led to some some RFP or request for, uh, for proposal um, practices that weren't ideal. So they would include uh, a lane, for example, that runs two weeks out of the year in an annual RFP. Um, and, and carriers and brokers would bid on that within their network. Um, and, and, then, and then that would never really fulfill or they would put it in the RFP that it's going to run in December and it runs in February. So nobody's really set aside capacity to handle that and honor those rates. Um, so that's really spot freight and it needs to be procured that way. So we have seen a significant shift in how shippers think about procuring their freight um, from a port, we call it a portfolio perspective. So on one end of the spectrum, you know, they've got their private fleets where it makes sense, where they have enough density and and uh, and, 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 and uh, volume in, in a market, or if they have very high service level requirements and they want full control of that transportation. And then moving down the spectrum, you've got dedicated fleets. So that's just an outsourced version of the private fleet. Um, and you've got your drop trailer lanes where you're um, more commonly going to rely on your larger asset based carriers. Um, and then you've got your live unload and load lanes where you can start to mix in a lot more broker freight. And, and I think shippers are starting to think more strategically about how to optimize the use of that broker because those as those large asset carriers in general don't want that live live freight, especially if it's got any volatility to it. Um, and then and then they've got spot right and now. We're starting to see different flavors of spot and how shippers procure that. Um, so it's kind of starting to break up into uh, three categories. There's the private network load board spot procurement. So that's like if they use Blue Jay or Manhattan TMS system um, and you're a broker that's participating in their network. So you're contracted with them. You've given them your insurance, all that. Um, you will start to see those spot loads um, fall into into that uh, spot load board and they'll procure it that way. Um, so that's like, you know, we, we call that dialing for diesel using the private load board. Right. Um, so that's kind of old school by now. Right. Um, but now they're starting to also use direct connect APIs. Um, so with, with some of these larger brokers that have a direct connect API connection uh, with the shipper. So. Um, when the when the load goes through the routing guide and no one accepts the tender, instead of going to that load board, they'll shoot it out to three or four API connected large brokers that will immediately send back a rate and their TMS system is making the decision to make the award right there on the spot. And they usually have some rules that they, they'll play by there, um, but there's some thresholds some tolerances. So they'll use like the DAT rate to create those thresholds can't be 10% over or something like that. Uh, and then finally, the new the newest trend is in-depth pricing. So um, this is for um, more consistent lanes. So maybe like lanes that are going to run two to three or four weeks out of the year, they're seasonal lanes. So this might fit into the produce uh, you know, conversation, but 
So, so they're going to go to some brokers and make agreements that, hey, we're going to run this freight somewhere between April and June for three weeks. Um, here's the volume that we're expecting to run. Could we come to an agreement that we will pay you within X percent of DAT spot rate during those weeks? And that just really streamlines the process for the shipper. So they're not having to manually let those loads slip down to a load board, make the tenders. They've got an agreement in place. The broker is going to take those loads. So all of that spot rate um, is going to trickle down to some degree into the DAT load board um, one way or another. Right. So that broker in that private network scenario, they'll get those loads. They'll they'll make their award. And then they may they may already have a carrier that can satisfy that for them with the existing contract. But if not, they'll go out to the DAT load board, try to procure it through that. So that's um, that's the newest trend that we're starting to see. It has materialized into more um, shipper freight ending up in what we call just spot, um, which would include the index pricing, the AP, the connections and the load board procurement balance for diesel that I mentioned. So all of those, we're seeing a, a marked increase mix of freight that is falling into that spot. Um, and, and that does appear to be intentional from, from most of the shippers um, a, as we hear back from them in our conversation. So did that, did that raise any questions? I've got a few. Okay. If, 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 okay. So um, you, you kind of answered it in that last statement where you said it's kind of an intentional thing that they're bringing freight to the spot market. Is this because spot market's cheaper now? um compared to what it was say a year and a half ago where you know you had your contract and then spot market you could pay twice three times as much depending on which trucks were in the area do you find that this is a lot like you are you finding the pattern more of the 2018 into 19 pattern where 2018 when prices really started to skyrocket all these shippers put out rfps and then 2019 like i don't know what the number is 95 percent of them were not honored because the spot market was a better place to move your freight from a cost perspective like, do you find that as one of the key pieces or are shippers getting into these rfps and dipping into the spot market to more set up their suppliers for the next round of fluctuations in the market and what i mean by that is the next dip or increase that we have where capacity tightens? Yeah, great question. So it seems kind of obvious right now that the answer would be yes, they're using more spot right now because it's cheaper relative to uh, two years ago. Um, yeah. But, but we see this also relative to 2019. So for perspective, in 2019, our shippers had about 11% of their freight in this spot category. And right now they're sitting around 15%. So even compared okay. relative to that soft market, we are seeing an increase um, usage of spot. And just for perspective, like the peak, you know, like February, March, 2021, they were at 22%. So that's come down significantly. Um, so, so the difference between that 15% that we're currently at and that 22%, you could call it like undesirable spot. Um, right. So, so right now they're very intentional about what they're putting out to spot. And they can control that. When the market gets very tight, these RFPs awards start to slip, right? They don't hold for as long. You get that routing guide leakage that I talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, I think you're you're exactly right. Right now, they are very intentional, and they'll do things like um, they'll they'll make an RFP award during these soft markets um, and only award one carrier to the lane. And if that one carrier doesn't accept, they're going straight to spot. In a tight market. Oh, as opposed to going like A, B, and C carriers, right. they go straight to spot after yes. the one. Interesting. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I say spot, it could be a direct connect mm -hmm. API connection, an index agreement, or a load their internal load board. Um, but so, it yeah. goes to a rate that's not necessarily contracted that's right. inside an RFP. Yes. So when it doesn't necessarily go to DAT's load board, but it goes to what right. would be considered a spot market saying, hey, give me a rate on this lane as of right now. Yeah, from a shipper's yeah. perspective, when they talk about spot market load board, they're most large shippers, they're talking about their Blue Jay load board or their E2 Open now, I think, um, or Manhattan load board. It's their internal private network, right? 
I kind of use the the example of my my typical customer might have an a hundred million dollars of annual freight spend. They'll have a hundred carriers in their network, and maybe fifteen of those are brokers. Um, so they're direct contracting with with those you know eighty five asset based players, and so they'll have the the top ten largest in their network. Typically, some mix of that, and then they have that longer tail of smaller carriers. Um, and they definitely see value in those smaller carriers and because those smaller carriers can often be very competitive in niche markets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and then so um, bringing it back to that routing guide um, in the tighter markets. Uh, so back back in 2021, um, they will publish multi- intentionally. They'll go down four, five, six deep in that routing guide. So that tender will roll and they're hoping one of those catches because the last thing they want is it to go out to the, their internal load board spot market where they're exposed to significant premiums. Um, it, and also right now in this soft market, I wanted to point out, right, they're, they're being strategic about using spot because it is cheaper. Some of them are doing that. Um, but but they are limited in what they can do that with, especially the large shippers. You know, normally somewhere between 50 to 80 percent of their freight is going to be drop drop. Uh, and that normally can't go out into the spot market. Um, so so they'll be restricted to using an asset based carrier in their network. It's difficult to procure that through the spot market. So there's only so much of their freight that they can do this type of um, short routing guide, go out to spot intentionally type of thing. Chad, yeah, have you um, asked the question or is there a common theme for 2024 that shippers are talking about like what it in in your opinion and and i don't know if you have this data it's just off the top of my head um like what are they talking about what are they looking to accomplish most of them in 2024 is it like a back to whatever is normal and let's let's flatline the base and kind of create sis, recreate systems again to make sure we're like how how are these shippers thinking about the next shift in the market yeah, so typically during these soft seasons, and, and we're, we're kind of starting to land probably somewhere at the bottom right now, right? I think everybody kind of agrees on that. Maybe we're close to the bottom. And I think everybody's looking out to next year, 2024, and thinking Q2, Q3, shippers could start facing some headwinds, start getting increased routing guide leakage, um, start getting rate increases on their RFPs, spot premiums starting to excel. Um, so I think right now they're trying to prepare for that strategically and the timing of their RFPs. Most of our shippers and most of them are larger shippers. They have a, a pretty strict RFP schedule um, and they try to stick to that to honor those agreements. Um, and they, they kind of take pride in that. Like we're not going to go outside of schedule. Um, we're always going to do our RFP in February um, or, or in July or something like that. They'll try to stick to that. Um, and, and right now, during this time where they have more leverage in the marketplace from a rate perspective, um, many of them are also trying to improve their perception with their partners as a you mm. the shipper of choice. Right. So we're doing those things that you 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 want uh, as a shipper that carriers and brokers want to partner with. Um, so we're paying you on time. Uh, we're communicating well with you. Um, things like that. We're, we're making it making sure our facilities um, are acceptable um, for the drivers to come into, use the bathroom, take a break, things like that. If, you know, turn that equipment fast, not sit on trailers too long, those types of things. So, so um, you know, smart shippers are monitoring that right now. They don't, and they're, and they're probably selling that, right. As they're meeting with their carriers and going through carrier reviews and things like that. Um, they're, they're starting to sell that, Hey, we're a shipper of choice that you want to do business with. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that can be sticky through that tight cycle. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, Jeff, you asked about supply chain design and if if shippers are starting to get closer to their customers. I, I think in general, that is um, a, 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 a general true statement that shippers do want to physically get closer to their shippers. They use our rate data to do things like um, supply chain design optimization. So they'll ask sure. a question decision science ask questions where should i put my next plant that's often based on transportation costs um, and service uh, right so the closer they are to their customer the higher the service level um 
And so we, we're, we're not seeing, I'm not seeing significant drops in length of haul across our network. Um, our dry van network length of haul is about 475. Um, and I, I mean, I'm seeing it come down the last couple of quarters, but I haven't given it enough attention to, to tell if that's just a seasonal effect or, or what. Okay. Interesting. That's some serious, um, I don't know about you guys, but I learned a lot today. Um, I, it's interesting. The one thing to me that really sticks out is the fact that the direct connect API, like using technology to actually enhance their ability to get things done. Like, can you get any better than that? And then what really actually, um, gave me a shock Chad is when you said that it's typically the one carrier and then it goes direct to the spot market. Um, whatever their version of the spot market is, whether it be in their blue J load board or whatever. Um, that to me is, and, and Jeff, you're, you're kind of like the RFP guy in this conversation. You do most of them. That to me is actually, um, very interesting because I'm wondering, do RFP submissions now say, hey, your first, second, third, fourth in line, you've been awarded this as a second tier carrier, you've been, or is it, <laughs> has it completely changed? Well, I would, I would think right now, I mean, being on that side of the business for over 35 years, um, working for a hundred million dollar transportation spend company, you know, we used to have primary, uh, secondary, tertiary carriers where they would fall into those specific buckets. One, because I wanted to build loyalty. I wanted to have congruency with all my carriers who understood my business better than anybody else. Yeah. When you go to the spot market, um, you risk. You you risk mm. a lot. There's a lot. There's a risk reward kind of trade off there, right? Now you're One, talking. You're talking like load board spot market. Yeah. When you go when you go to that kind of uh, drop and you're trying to save money. One, one thing that you're you're doing to your incumbent carriers is that you're going to lose a lot of them because they're going to come back to you and say, well, what have you done for me lately when that market, <laughs> when that market shifts yeah. and you've got this giant ass void that needs to be filled and you've got a carrier that has a thousand equipment, but you told them to go pound salt because you were going to the bottom. Not a wise decision because what you think you're saving now, you're going to spend on the backside, but you just don't know it yet because now you're trying to reinvent the wheel that was already created, but you let it go because you were looking at the almighty dollar. It's uh -huh. good now, but in the long run, it's really bad it, it, because it will come back and bite you in the ass if you don't know what you're doing. You know, a lot of the times the, the uh, one-offs are like, let's just say the upper peninsula um, in Michigan, right? Not too many carriers go, but some carriers just to come back and go, hey, you know what? We'll do it to complement the account, but we're running at 104, 107 uh, OR. No, get rid of that because that one lane is going to hit all of the other lanes that I'm trying to save because it's that trickle down effect. You know, it spreads out over the, over the period of time. But going that, I mean, RFPs right now, they're short term. Anybody that's in the long term are going to lose their shirt the way I look at it right now. Because if you're locked in for a year and that market uh, changes, you know what carriers are going to do. You know what, uh, Mr. Shipper, I'm sorry, but, you know, since the market's changed, I'm going to have to take 11% increase. You know what I'm saying? That's not going to work. That that will not work. So you have to be uh, strategic in the in the partnerships that you're building right now. Uh, don't build them for today and the cost structure. Build it for 2024 and set yourself up uh, to be in position A because it's not happening now. You want to predict the future and what will happen and where you're going to be at that time when the market flips. So I've got a question for all of you, and I'd love your opinion on this, because Jeff, you just brought up um, one of the most frustrating points that I have with this industry, and it's the industry as a whole, is <clears throat> where is the, hey, we're going to do X, right? This lane, this is what we need to be profitable. The only variable is fuel. Let's, let's call a spade a spade, right? Yeah. Now, Drivers have increased pay. Um, by now, carriers have adjusted to the new costs, right? Like, you hope. 
Oh, right, right. Well, I would like to think professional carriers have, right? Like the ones that are actually running a company, a sustainable company that's going to be around sure. for years. So let's just, with this question, assume that we, we have our costs in line. When capacity tightens, if you're still delivering to that area at the volume that you're delivering to that area, nothing's changed besides fuel. So why is it that we act with outside elements that are not part of this specific run. And I think of Rico when I think of this question, right? right Rico's right, got right. dedicated, he goes specific ways back and forth. Rico's cost didn't triple during COVID. He didn't triple his cost to his customers during COVID. He didn't drop his rates right now during COVID, post COVID. So where is the, A, I agree to this RFP on this rate. I'll do the freight for a year. We have a fuel adjusting in there. If any major like economic thing happens, we'll have a conversation. But just because that lane has now gone up by 10%, you're, you should not charge your customer 10% more because that's what it is now. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. I made a decision years ago to rent my furnace, my air conditioning right. and my hot water tank, right? I just, I was sick of the reinvesting 10, 15 grand every couple of years and paying for service and all this crap. So what I did is I, I took ones eight years ago. They just sent me a letter now saying their price has gone up 6%. So is my, my stuff. And I called them and I said, hold on, I've had this stuff for eight years. Your price hasn't gone up now. And the your equipment depreciated. So I said, if you're going to charge me an additional 8%, you better come and replace all my equipment for no. free. Yeah, I want new equipment. I want the latest state of the art technology. That to me is fair. Mm -hmm. If you buy something three years ago, you've paid for that three years ago. Don't tell me it's going to cost me five or 10% more. And this is the same thing in our market. Like, and, and I understand when COVID happened, it was all this crazy shit and, and things are going haywire. But now let's face it, we're calmed down, right? So, so why are these things? And then vice versa, when, a shipper puts out an RFP and things drop in the market and they don't honor the RFP. That's bullshit from that side too. So I, I just like to get your guys thoughts on this. And I'm sorry, I got really passionate about it because this is the one thing that drives me nuts it's, about this industry. Like me. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and it, it's like, okay, I get it. But why can't we just sit down, create a deal that's profitable for both people? Like Dean's always said, leave something on the table for somebody else and let's fucking go. Hey, like, I got the answer for you, and it's your answer to your own question. It really is. And I'm going back that? months, Dan, and you'll agree yeah. with me wholeheartedly. Cost plus. Yes. It goes with the market. It goes with the market. You don't have to worry about that. If you can cut that deal on a contract and saying, you know what? Here's the contract. We're going to follow the market. Here's the adjusted cost for right now as it adjusts over time, over quarter. We're always going to have that cost plus 10% or cost plus 15% on top of that. So as it moves, my cost is the same. You know so now let me ask you is. this though, Jeff, because here this brings up actually another point. And it is, if your cost, right? So let's do the carrier customer scenario, right? Carrier has cost of X amount, two bucks a mile, 210 a mile is their cost to get or with profit to get X place, right? right. right. Thousand miles, 2,100 bucks. Let's just call it that. Right. In six months, if you still have the same freight going down, your cost minus fuel, so actually not full cost, is still going to be 2100 bucks. Even if the market says it's $2,600, you should charge your customer $2,100 because that's fair because your cost hasn't changed. If your cost changes going down or to whatever location, then I think there's a conversation about markets. Hey, listen, markets have changed you know, uh, whatever, this thing's moved because of the Panama Canal. People Make are sure you got it in writing, though. Yeah, when you do that contract so, saying... Know, but contracts aren't worth the paper they're written on. Like, how many of them just them. go to the wayside every year? <laughs> I, 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 think right? it's, like, um, I think it's an interesting study in psychology, right? I mean, because you, you're running that lane, your cost hasn't changed, your profitability is, is, should be the same, right? If yeah. everything else is equal. Um but those alternatives are out there and they're pulling yeah. on you, right? And so in this prolification of information that we have today, right? Um, you know, 
going back 20 years ago, they would have had to find out through talking to somebody at the truck stop um, what yeah. the things are. But now they have it on their phone 24-7, yep. and, and they know what the rate of change is. Um, and, and there's pluses to that, right? It, it, it increases the efficiency of the marketplace to some degree, but um, they're, they're getting pulled on by those alternatives because they know they can right. they can go to another shipper and, and get you know twenty percent more profit, and that that sure is tempting. And you have this uh, what do they call it FOMO, right? This fear of missing out. <laughs> I'm going to miss this. I'm going to miss this peak, and here I'm going to glide through it. And then there's risk on the other end when the market goes back down that your shipper is going to try to put the screws to you and, and, and ask you for a rate decrease. So all of that is playing into the psychology of it. And um, it's, it's very difficult to not uh, give your shipper a rate increase. I, I think from a shipper's perspective, one of the things that they appreciate a lot, and I think what buys um, some, some reciprocity in the long run is um, if the carrier would go to them and say, hey, I know the market's up 10 percent. I would agree to a 5 percent increase um, right now. And I'll, I'll, I'll just keep I'll just stay on this lane, keep servicing you as well as I have. Um, I, I think most shippers appreciate that. It, it also avoids them having to go out to RFP and they know that that lane's locked in now. And I actually got a pretty good deal based on the marketplace. Um, and so. Chad, I would I would second that and also add as a supplier to this shipper. When the market goes down 10 percent, reduce your cost by five percent if you if you're going if you're going to ask for it when it goes up yeah. don't Absolutely. be the one that makes your shipper call you yes go down. yes and that, I think this is a key lie. point yeah, yeah but it's also about the value proposition as a service provider that you're always putting on the table compared to your competitors you know yes. i mean the price could change yeah. but if there's a real strong value that you know a lot, you're sitting at the table, you know more than others. It's kind of hard to part with somebody with that much knowledge that understands everything. Because just think about all the time, SG&A costs and everything above your head. It's going to cost you to duplicate that over a period of time. It's, it's irreplaceable. It really is. If you're in that deep with a customer for many, many years, it's irreplaceable. You you will not be able to find the same type of value add. You will not. But Jeff, what do you say to the point of, you know, you're in a relationship for many years and let's say hypothetically as a shipper, you feel like you're now not necessarily being taken advantage of, but you, you feel like almost your suppliers, um, not at the mercy of your supplier. I'm trying to figure out how to say this in the, it's made so much sense in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'll come to me, Jeff, but what, what I'm, what I'm, I guess where I'm trying to get at is, you know, you have a supplier yep. and at a certain point, I know Naval Ravanek uh, said something. He says like, listen, if you can't work with somebody for life, don't work, work, work with them for a day. So at, at what point does a shipper say, yes, this carrier is really good for me or this broker is really good for me, but I have a feeling you're taking advantage when the market's good for them. They're the ones that call me when the market's not good. They avoid me like play, right? Yep. Um, there is these situations out there every day, all day long that this is happening to shippers. And when I speak to shippers, I say, you know, what, what's, and they say, yeah, all the time. When the market changes and carriers need more money, my phone's ringing off the hook. When the market flips and I should be reducing prices, it's almost up to me to go out, get new prices, go to my carriers and say, you're going to lose the lanes unless you can meet these prices. And so I, I just, I look at it from that two-sided street, right? There, it's always got to be a two-way street. It can't be a one-way street. There can't be stoplights. Like it's got to be a, a good flow for everyone. And I don't know what that, answer is it's more just a thought like well, what do you guys here's the question you have to ask yourself what kind of real true uh relationship do you have with that customer if they're coming back to you and asking you to cheapen your cost you know i mean the thing is is that you have to get to a point where you can tell the cu first of all i don't believe that the customer is always right number one i think it's a farce right because when yeah, you're wrong true. you have to you have to call them out that's the type of relationship the, the justification for everything that you do with them and everything they do with you, 
why do you need to do this? Where's the justification, you know, and have that bickering going back and forth. Because if they truly value what you bring to the table, Dan, they're not going to want to get rid of you. They're going to want to say, come in, let's sit down. Where do you need to be? Hey, Mr. Shipper, where do you need to be? Hey, Mr. Carrier, as a service provider, where do you need to be? You know, how, how's your business? Instead of talking about rates and everything like that, just have that conversation with like the round table, your, your, the shipper, service provider and carrier sitting at a table, just having a normal discussing what's ramping up, what's coming in the future, what's not coming in the future. Are you going to are you going to slow down this lane or are you going to increase it? You know, it's all about the what ifs and looking at mm -hmm. that proactively instead of reactive. If you if you have a reactive mindset, you've lost. Yeah. Oh, I thought he was done. He froze. <laughs> Chad, what's your thought on that? <laughs> um, well, it brought up, a. I, I was just remembering one of the challenges um, that I would face as a shipper where the scenario would be, you know, I've got a broker in my network um, that handles all spots. So they're, they're doing a hundred percent of the freight they do for me as spot. Um, and they, they kind of pride themselves on taking the toughest freight that you have out there, right? So it's the load that's sitting out there on a Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. and it picks up tomorrow morning. Um, you know, short lead time, um, high service standards. Um, and, and so, but to cover that, they have to charge extreme premiums because they're faced with, it, especially in a tight market. Um, and that that is dangerous it's a it's a value to the shipper but it's dangerous from a perception standpoint because they can get labeled the expensive broker yeah uh, the price gouging broker so it just reminded me of that and and uh, so communication is really really key at the upper levels because absolutely because as a like at the director of transportation level i would be faced with you know vp comes around that broker's too expensive all the time fire them um, and, and it's difficult to prove it out with data that, hey, it's the, it's the scenarios that they're helping us out in. And if you take this option off the table, now my alternatives are even worse. Um, mm. And I even had brokers in my network that would tell me straight up, I can cover some of that really difficult freight of yours, but I would have to charge you too much and I don't want to risk my reputation. Mm. Um, that's an honest broker. Yeah, that's an honest broker and, it's, and that's difficult to work through. So you have to work with them to, and I would pull on them and say, look, I want you to get in there and, and put some bids in and I'll protect you. I'll protect your reputation because I've got transparency and visibility. So um, just just reminded me of that scenario that we would have to work through. A shipper having good, clean, analytical data uh, helps a ton in that to be able to just show right out. Let, let me set the level playing field on all my carriers. Here's all my spot freight, and and now compare my carriers just in the spot, spot just on short lead time, um, and and now that levels out the playing field a little bit, and now your your labeled uh, gouging broker looks okay. Hmm.